Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna be repairing another Commodore 64. Not this one, this is my Ziv 64. We'll be taking a look at a motherboard that is a real basket case, got some severe damage on it. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Right, so here we have a 64C short board. This is the much later version or the very latest version because the PLA chip, which is this large IC, it doesn't even have the color RAM IC off to the side. It's actually integrated into this IC. So this was pretty much the last 64 made while well, this design was the last one made. Henning sent me several of these boards and I think he was in Germany. So this will be a PAL board. One giveaway is, of course, no toggle switch here for the channel selector on the RF modulator. And another giveaway is this little jumper pad right here. It says short for PAL or open for NTSC, and it has a little blob of solder on there. So it is closed the loop, which should enable PAL mode to the missing 8701 clock generator. In addition to this little jumper, though, you do also need a new crystal oscillator, the correct value for PAL, which I am forgetting right now. I think it's like 17 megahertz or so, and the NTSC one will be 14.3 megahertz. So we can tell by my diagnostic note here from when I got this, uh, we have no RAM. So someone stole the RAM and the bypass caps. Like, why steal the bypass caps? We have no clock synthesizer chip. That's the A701. We're missing the SID chip, of course. And there is a damaged socket over here for one of the ROM chips. This looks like a bit of a hack job. So I must've taken the ROM chip out, stuck it in here. And the problem is, is if you remove an IC and you don't clean off all the solder on it and you stick in one of these cheap dual wipe sockets you get from China, when you pull that chip out, it's pretty much guaranteed, not guaranteed, but it, it's there's a good chance it's gonna do this kind of damage to the socket. That does not happen with this round hole type. These are harder to get chips into, but you'll never have this problem with the socket getting damaged like this. When we flip the board over, <laughs> oh, this is carnage. I mean, look, it's like burned over here. And <laughs> what did they use to remove this chip? So I think the very first thing I need to do is try to clean this up. I need to remove this socket, get all this black gunk off, uh, clean out the holes for the RAM, and let's see if we can revive this board. All right, so those pins are left in there. And this kind of goes back to what I talked about in a previous video on these repairs. If you're trying to remove a chip that you know is bad, like say one of these RAM chips, use some cutters, like these ones sitting right here, and you cut away the top of the package, leaving just the pins in the board. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my soldering iron, a little bit of solder and some tweezers, and we're gonna remove these pins from the board. So we just add a little bit of fresh solder onto the tip, and you place it down at the bottom, and those pins should come right out very easily. Do not force them out. They should basically fall out once you heat up the, the pad. There's another one. And then this last one here, it's gonna be a bit harder because it's on a, a ground plane. There we go, it came right out. And we do the same thing with these. And the reason why these like stayed behind in the board is because they are on a power plane there. You can see this copper here makes it harder for the desoldering iron to melt the solder all the way through the via. So it kind of leaves it on the top. And there we go. So that's it. That's all the pins out of there. Now I just have to clean that up. Now you could use some good quality solder wick. I don't know where mine is. I think I've misplaced it. But because I have the desoldering gun, I'm going to use that. It's a lot easier. I'm just going to try to clean this up a little bit. Wow, it's just so bad. I'm just using 99% IPA to clean this and a brush just because I want to have a better look at what's underneath. <laughs> oh boy. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to reflow solder into each one of these and then I'm gonna clean it out with the desoldering iron. All 
All right, well, I did my best trying to clean this up and uh, it's pretty much a disaster. So what I have here is some acetone. And I'm just trying to clean off some of this flux. It just is not coming off. Oops, I just spilled some on the bench. It's not coming off with the regular IPA. Acetone is definitely a bit stronger. I just really am trying to reveal what exactly is going on underneath here. Looks like there's at least two vias on the top that are completely gone. So yeah, these two vias on the top there are just gone. There's really nothing to solder onto. And then it looks like that trace that's right there might be damaged as well. So I need to double check that. Let's check the other side. Whoa. Let's slather this on. The board is actually warped right here where the rework has been done in the past. Okay, but the acetone is really working really well. Look, it's got all that massive pile of the gunk off there. When I talk about acetone, I'm using nail polish remover, which pretty much you can buy anywhere in the US at least, 100% uh, acetone. I think I got this at the dollar store. Be careful though, because if this drips onto ABS plastic or other types of plastic, it completely melts it and deforms it. So really you gotta keep it off of ABS. Seems to be fine on PCBs and stuff, although I wouldn't pour it on everywhere because you never know there might be components that it might damage. But as you see here, it, it did help a lot. It's not magic though, and the warped board here is not gonna be fixed with some acetone, nor are these burn marks over here. Let's put some uh, IPA back on here. Look at that, you can really see the burn marks. When I put the IPA on there, unbelievable. I'm thinking this fiberglass pen may help as well. So I'm just gonna try to rub this down a little bit. Maybe that'll clear things up a little bit. All right, I've broken out the Anden Star HDMI microscope so we can try to get a better look at the damage to this board. Up on the top side of the board here, we can see some of the substantial damage up here in the corner. So this trace here is obviously not connected to that via anymore. And that via had a trace. That trace originally went to right there and it's been lifted. So we're gonna have to uh, replace that. Let me just try to break this we break that part off there since that's not doing anything, but could cause a short. Over on this side, we do have some damage, but it looks like everything is still connected. Uh, is that normal? That trace that's wobbly like that? I can't imagine that's how it was originally. I mean, this is, this is ugly, but it should still work, all of this here. This right here looks like it actually is broken, doesn't it? Over on this side here, this uh, via is not in the best shape, but it should be okay. I don't think anything connected to it on the top side. That you'd think is broken, but I think that's just paint on there. Yep, that, that scratch is free. The rest of these vias up to there look okay. This poor trace here has been mangled quite badly as well, but I think it should be all right. And here we are on the back side of the board. So these traces are a bit of a disaster, but I think it should be okay. Nothing attaches to these two pins on the bottom. This stuff all looks connected. I mean, for better or for worse, the PCB is quite damaged and everything here is okay. That one's just a bit bent. Over to the other side, we have just tons of damage, but nothing is connected down here anyways. So it is okay. Hopefully I can get the pin through there. Again, um, yep, look at that one. Wow, it's just mangled. It's so mangled up. Might not be able to get the pin through there, but everything is okay. There's nothing actually connected on the bottom side except for like this one here. So yeah, it looks like we, if I can get the socket in there, we just need to connect up two pins on the other side. Well, it'll be on the back side, but those two top traces are the ones that are damaged. All right, while I have the microscope connected, let's just take a look at the RAM here to make sure that uh, none of this is damaged. No, everything looks completely fine here. No trace damage whatsoever. There's a good view of the burned part of the PCB. Poor thing. Looks like everything is still connected though. And here is the backside of the RAM. Other than damage to the board, um, everything is okay from a pin standpoint. No problem, there'll be any issues putting a socket back in there. All right, I have the two sockets inserted into the board. So let me flip this over and connect them up as best I can at least. The RAM should be easy. And then I will do the bodge wires. 
Now remember on the back side, like some of those vias were just gone, at least on the back side, but they were there on the top side, so they, they were partially damaged. So you have to make sure that you still do solder those pins. So I, I applied heat and then I added solder and it allowed it to go down into whatever was left of the via. And uh, this pin was an example, this corner pin. And I remember that was one of the wiggly traces that were there. So I have the multimeter here. Let's uh, tone that out. Pretty sure this one should go right there to this via and it is connected. So like I said, even though on the back side right here, there was like seemingly nothing left, it did actually make a good connection between there and um, that trace. Now over here, there were some traces that were all wiggly and exposed. Uh, I think it was like this pin here went to there. I wanna make sure it's not shorted to these pins and it's not, and that's just because it's all very close together right there. I spray a little bit of alcohol on there and I rub it with a brush. It might make it a little easier just to see what's going on because there, there is a little bit of flux residue from the soldering process. So yeah, I was just double checking that these pins here weren't shorted to this trace and they weren't. All right, well, this was my little diagram that I made and it was these two top pins on the ROM chip. So that and that should have connected to that pin and that pin on this ROM. And of course, since there's no bodge yet, that's not connected there or there. So let's flip this around and run those bodges. I'm gonna use this thin wire, which is wire wrap wire. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to kind of rough the length out. Doesn't need to be perfect. I'll cut it more in a second. And then you just tin the ends. Oops, yeah, I get off, there we go. <laughs> and I'm just doing the Ben Hex style here where I'm basically melting right through the uh, insulation to make a connection. I saw him doing this, uh, I don't remember, I think he was building like a portable Atari 2600 or something like that. And uh, this was the method he used that just, uh, made it a lot easier to get the exact wire length you needed. One of the issues with this particular wire though is uh, it's very heat resistant to uh, the insulation. So you really have to melt it to uh, try to get through it. So we should be going from this top pin to here. We are. And the bot next pin to the fourth one down. And we are. And I think the next one down should be this one. And it is, okay, cool. So theoretically, that should be it. Okay, I do need the bypass caps in here and I need to make a ROM chip that is compatible with this one here. All right, I installed a couple bypass caps. I actually couldn't find my bypass caps, 100 nanofarad. So I took these off a dead board, an old motherboard. I also grabbed another 8701 from a different motherboard because uh, for testing, this thing will not work at all without an 8701. But a SID chip and this ROM chip are not necessary for testing because I can use the dead test cartridge. And what's useful about the dead test cartridge is it bypasses all the onboard ROMs, which on this machine are these two chips here and can work without them. So video is connected, dead test is in, let's plug in the power, see what happens. We oh, hey, look at this, dead test, zero page. This dead test looks a little bit different than I'm used to, but I think that's what the EEPROM is on here. I, I have an enhanced version here, dead test version 1.20. I think this was a community project to enhance the dead test a little bit. So it's testing the screen RAM right now, which is inside of the PLA. Ignore the fact that the video is sort of flickering in and out a little bit, uh, getting brighter and darker. That is my cable. It is a bad cable. I need to <laughs> replace this. All right, well, the RAM test, the color RAM, the screen RAM, stack, zero page, all passed. That's a good indicator that this board is pretty much ready to go. Just have to add a ROM and we need to add um, a SID chip and maybe we'll have a working 64C. Okay, out with the dead test. And this is the ROM chip that's missing to see 901-22501. Same exact chip that's used on the original 64 boards. So with that in and the SID missing, let's turn this back on. We should get the basic prompt. Hmm, no, not quite. I also have to say that this machine is jail bar city. Just look at those jail bars.
Okay, I'm gonna stick the easy flash in. Okay, it is working. Oh, I wish this wire were not bad. Okay, I put a new cable on so it won't be flickery so badly with the video. Okay, there we go. Now it's a solid connection. So I think this ROM that's not working, which of course is the socket that I just replaced, I think it's the character ROM. Oh, and look, the machine just blanked out. I wonder what is happening here. I think the problem could be that this cartridge slot just needs a little bit of deoxid in there. All right, let's see if it works now and glitches out. Okay, I think that was just a bad connection in the cartridge connector because, oops, <laughs> that was me pushing a button on the easy flash. Seems to be okay now, but that is not gonna fix the problem with this uh, ROM not working. And I know this is ROM chip itself is good. In fact, what we can do is we can test this inside the retro chip tester. Let's quickly do that. Unfortunately, I lost the footage of me testing this chip, but it did come back as a C64 character ROM. So the ROM is totally fine. So the next thing I want to do is install a SID chip and test out Easy Flash 3. All right, SID chip is in. Let's turn this on. Okay, we're getting this again. Uh, let's see, why don't we use the diagnostic cartridge? So it's not even booting to basic. Power this on. Okay, this is definitely running. We haven't run this yet. That's the regular diagnostic, right? Only ran the dead test so far. All right, it's very interesting. It's doing the RAM test. I'm noticing some slight flicker in the image and I've changed the video cords, so that's not the problem now. Uh-oh, PLA test bad. That's not good because I don't have a replacement of these types of PLAs. Kernel and basic ROM show as bad, but the character ROM, which is the one I replaced here, shows as good. So I should realize the blue screen, when I turn it on without a cartridge, is not the character ROM. It is that bad basic or kernel ROM showing its ugly head. This chip right here is a combination of the basic and the kernel on this later version of the C64. Originally, of course, this was three chips. The thing is, this ROM that has the kernel and basic must be partially working at least because it's impossible for this diagnostic cartridge to even work. And earlier, of course, we had the Easy Flash booting as well. Uh, it might actually still boot. Let's just give that a try. So we turn this on. Uh, there it is. So that is still working. I think what I'm going to do is reflow all the solder joints on that ROM chip, that large ROM chip, because some of them looked pretty rough from this horrible abuse and rework that had happened to the character ROM chip. I can definitely say this chip doesn't look like it was ever removed. If that reflow didn't have any measurable effect, then I'm gonna take that out and we'll test it outside of this board. And because of all the trauma that this board has suffered in this area, I'm really suspecting that this ROM is problematic more so than the PLA. So let's give this a try with the diagnostic cartridge again. Okay, still showing that ROM as bad. Now, it goes without saying that a bad PLA can make ROMs show bad because the PLA is what selects that ROM. The ROM can actually be bad, and I think it can falsely say the PLA is bad, but the also the ROM can be good and the PLA might be the problem, and you know, you kind of have both interacting with each other causing an issue. Let's try without the cartridge, see if we get anything. Nope, okay. All right, I think the only thing I can do now is take that chip out and verify it. It's a regular EEPROM, or I can read it in a regular EEPROM programmer, like a TL-866, but I'm just gonna test it in the Retro Chip Tester Pro, and we'll see if it's good. And if it's good, we're in trouble, because that means the PLA on here is bad. Okay, as I suspected, there's no problems underneath here, so I really don't think, well, other than this rip trace right here, we knew about that one and uh, this one we already knew we had to fix so we had those two bodge wires so those uh, but yeah everything else here seems fine so no issues and everything on the bottom looks good that that chip came out pretty easily so let me just uh, straighten these legs out a little bit and we grab the retro chip tester pro that goes in there like so 
So it's saying it's a 128, that's fine. And that's because it's the same chip on the 128 and on uh, these particular boards. So that's a problem because clearly this chip is working fine. Doesn't mean that there's nothing wrong with this chip. It might be marginal and the chip tester can read it okay, but in this board, it's not happy. So I'm gonna still put a socket in anyways. All right, here we are on Zimmers. Let's find the ROM we need. Let's see here, 64C. It's a 16 kilobyte 23128 ROM. It contains the basic interpreter and it has the kernel. So this is the one we need. And it has exactly the same part number as this chip here. All right, and we'll load that into here. There it is. And I have an EEPROM in the programmer here. So let's program this. Just for good measure, I'm gonna hit program a few times. That's kind of what I do with these uh, older chips. This particular one has a 21 volts programming voltage, which is the upper limit of this uh, particular TL866. And I have the first generation one, which uh, unlike the later one, as you see here, can actually go up to 21 volts. Okay, the EEPROM is in the socket. Let's give this a try. We'll know pretty quickly if this is working because of course um, we will see that white or the basic screen if all is good. But if it still doesn't work, then this ROM is actually good and there might be a problem with the PLA. Here we go. Wow, it's even worse now. We're just getting a total black screen. We'll know that for sure by putting the original ROM back in. Of course, we should get at least the blue screen we were getting before. Oh, and we're not. So I made something worse. So my fixing is actually breaking. All right, so let's try the diagnostic cartridge again. Not the dead test, but the regular Diag. Let's see if it comes to life. Oh, look at that. Interesting. It's so strange that this runs. Their PLA still so bad. It's very weird that this works because usually when you have no kernel ROM and no basic, you can't even run this diagnostic at all. Yeah, same, same bad thing showing up there. What the heck is going on? This is so odd. If I take the chip out entirely and we turn on the computer. Uh, okay. I guess you don't need this chip in there. It kind of flies in the convention of everything I always thought about this diagnostic ROM requiring the kernel and the basic, or at least the kernel to work. Clearly not. Just for fun, let's pop out the character ROM. I don't think this is gonna work anymore. Yeah, okay, that's what you get. I am kind of curious if this cartridge works without the kernel ROM in there. Nope. So Easy Flash does need a working kernel and basic. All right, it's time to break out the oscilloscope here. Okay, so we need to check out the schematic. So here's that ROM, the one we're talking about, the 27 or 23, 128. This is the left part of the schematics and the lines that go off to the right side go over to this page and you see here is the character ROM. So the character ROM has address lines zero through 11 and those two bodged wires I added were probably 10 and 11. But the basic and kernel ROM also has 12 and 13. So we need to make sure that those are connected. Now it is connected to address line 14 on the CPU and that's because of, see the addressing there, it's E000 to F, 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 F and A000 to B, F, 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 F. It's two different blocks of memory, which is why address line 14 is connected here as opposed to address line 13. All right, so the oscilloscope's up on the screen. Uh, let's check address line 12 and 13 are connected properly. So there's pin two. And let me turn the computer off and on. Let's make sure we see activity here. We are not getting any activity. Uh, wait a second, what's happening here? Okay, that was weird. Uh, oh, uh, hmm, I'm confused. Okay, so I'm on the actual pin of the chip and you see there, it's sort of doing nothing. But when I go down onto the socket, there's actually it's actually high. Is this a problem? Oh, look at that. When I push it down, <laughs> so when I, oh man, okay. So when I physically push it, it makes a connection. That's weird. I, this, I think this socket I installed is actually bad. Let's go to this EEPROM since it has longer pins. Problem is this chip I took out, the 
pins are much shorter than they should be. So maybe they're just not making good contact in there. Okay, let's try this again. So I'm on the pin on the chip and we turn it on. Okay, this is actually making contact. So I guess that's, uh, you know, this is correct what we're seeing here. If I turn it off, turn it on. Yep, yeah, okay. And then pin 26. Okay, I'm on pin 26. Let's power cycle the computer. All right, looks the same. So those are definitely connected. I don't need to test the rest of the address lines because all of those are going right through this EEPROM. They're you know connected underneath the board here, and then they go to the character ROM, and the character ROM's working because we see it working with a diagnostic cartridge. So all those address lines are fine, and they're making its way through, including those two bodge wires. Okay, so one thing I'm curious about, I'm on address line, oh, what is this one? Seven, I think. It's the top pin on the, the ROM next to it. I bodged it over. When we turn it on, we see nice square waves. In fact, let's look at all the address lines, the other ones. I mean, these all look like really nice square waves. Okay, yeah, see that? Square waves. It's just when we look at two, we don't see square waves. We're seeing that weird triangle wave, which doesn't seem right, and then it's all stuck at the top while these other ones are bouncing around. I'm gonna remove this EEPROM entirely. Let's just double check that. Yeah, see, same thing. But if we go to the next pin down, then we're seeing nice square waves. Okay, I just realized what's happening. So address lines 15 through 12 on the CPU, when we see that curving wave, it's kind of indicative of a pull-up resistor when the bus is floating. And if we follow the lines down here, there it is right there. Address line 12, 13, 14, 15 is pulled up to five volts at 33K. And I think the reason for that is unlike on the regular 6502, just the old standard one, that thing cannot tri-state the address bus. It means that that CPU is always driving the address bus. But on the 6510, and I think on the later 65C02, it can actually disconnect itself from the bus, both the address lines and the data bus lines, for allowing like a bus mastering or a DMA function to happen. And on the 64, the VIC chip does need to talk to the RAM and also the ROM, the character ROM, in order to read that content out to display it. So I think that's what's going on, is all the lines that go to the character ROM are being driven by the VIC-2 chip, and um, those extra four lines there, which are pulled up, aren't. So they added a pull-up resistor to those. All right, so the address lines are all working fine on this machine, as are the data bus lines, because the machine is able to access the RAM and do other stuff. All that leaves us is the chip select line. And right here is pin 22 on uh, the ROM there. If we go over here, that is coming right here from the kernel basic pin on the PLA, unfortunately. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So I am on pin 22 and the ROM is not installed. Well, let's see what we see. Okay, well, we have activity on it. And that's coming from the PLA. All right, the EEPROM is back in and let's turn this back on. Yeah, I mean, that's apparently normal looking. I don't know. But we're definitely only getting a black screen. So it's definitely worse than it was before. I just need to go through all of these pins. Let's check for any issues here. All right, here we are on pin 27, and this is weird. So we see this activity down here, and lit 27 here says that this should be pulled to five volts, as, uh, as is this pin here, pin 28, and pin one. But that is not. With the EEPROM out, what do we get on here? Same thing. Oh, and I'm trying to figure out where that pin goes. I see it has a trace, and it seems to make its way under the character ROM. Let's uh, take that off. I'm breaking out the sharp probes here because I'm just really struggling. I mean, it's annoying that it's not right on the schematics, obviously. So this trace here kind of loops around under there. Looks like it's right here on the board. Let's poke through. Yep, there it is. And it looks like it's right here. 
Yep. And then it goes to what should be a via under the socket here, and it's not connected. Hmm. Let's see if I could show that. All right, see this little uh, silver blob there? The trace is right there and it goes into that, and yet there's no continuity. If I touch this, it's not working. And yet that has continuity to the trace right up to there. So this must be broken and I didn't notice it in the microscope. So I'm just gonna try to scrape this away and um, you know what I'm gonna have to do is cut away the socket. So now I cut it away, you can see what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna go from here and this trace right here. So there it is. And yet it should be going right to that and it's not. And definitely indeed trace is damaged and I guess I missed it. So I'm gonna use this uh, pen here, scratch some of that away. There we go. And let's tin that and I'll add a little tiny piece of wire onto it. Okay, that should do it. Let's see here. All right, it's definitely continuity now. Let's see where that via is going, which is that one. The trace comes up here. All right, goes to this via, which is connected to that pin. Let's see where that goes. Okay, goes to that, which goes to there, which goes to there, which is jumper to this. Oh, wow, okay, so it's jumpers. Pin 27 on a 128 EEPROM is required to be high all the time for the ROM to work, but on a 256 EEPROM, it's actually an address line and would allow you to select between two 16K ROM images almost as if Commodore built in support for having a switchable ROM like Jiffy DOS in the machine. I don't know how taking this out made that break underneath that chip, but it certainly did. I think that just needs to be pulled to five volts for the ROM to be selected. So let's put this back in, see if we at least get to back where it was kind of working. I think at this point now with this fix, it's gonna give us that blue screen. It's still not gonna work. I think there's still something else wrong with this machine. Yeah, okay, we're back to where we were before. So we're kind of getting a semi-working system, but there are definitely issues still with it. I don't know, this thing is a basket case because of all this hidden damage. Let's see if the Easy Flash is working like it was. Okay, it's working again. So this chip is sort of working, but clearly not fully. Okay, so we're back to where we were now that trace has been fixed. That means that this ROM is getting selected fully. Uh, did anyone catch my issue there? I had the character ROM in upside down. Oh dear, oh dear. Hopefully it's not damaged. These chips are pretty resilient to that. There we go, it's actually working fine. <laughs> okay, I'm running the diagnostics. Let's see what we see. Uh, PLA test is now okay. What? <laughs> what? This is crazy. It's now... Wait. Wait a second. Is this thing fixed? <laughs> is this thing actually fixed? <laughs> it was that bad trace the whole time? <laughs> what? Oh no. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I guess it was that trace the whole time and then <laughs> I thought it was all bad and the chip was in upside down. <laughs> oh God. Oh boy, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna reinsert this SID chip and we are gonna try to have an 8-bit dance party. <laughs> Easy flash into the machine. I'm gonna use a controller as opposed to a keyboard. I just don't have a keyboard handy. All right, <laughs> let's see if this works. Oh my God. All right, uh, Adrian's tools. Um, oh, wait, I don't know, the sound on him wasn't ready for this. It's working. And of course it's really slow because it's a PAL machine and this is the proper speed for the music. Okay, 
So um, before I claim total victory on this basket case of a machine, let's actually do the diagnostic again with the test harness connected and just validate, fully validate that everything is working. Okay, I think we're ready, powered on. I'm using an official Commodore loopback for the keyboard as opposed to the one that came with this kit, both work. Oh, come on, come on. Come on, almost there. Oh, it's working. That's it. This machine is fixed. It's freaking fixed. Okay, so let me assess what I've done here. The entire problem with this machine entirely was carnage from this ROM being removed. The original repair, and I'm putting that in quotes, only had a single bodge wire on it, which is uh, this little yellow one here, which was clearly not enough to make a working machine because it needed two bodge wires on the bottom due to damage caused from that chip being removed. But in addition, that trace that was under the ROM chip was also damaged, and I missed that even when I was looking through the microscope, which is totally my bad. And because of that, I removed the original basic and kernel ROM, which is sitting right here, and I put in a socket and an EEPROM, and once that trace was fixed, this machine is all good. But I guess the problem now is that these pins on this uh, original ROM, which are a bit short, just don't make good contact in that socket, which is a little weird because I haven't really had that problem ever before. Uh, but if I push down on it hard, it, it does work. But um, I'm just gonna try one more time with the original chip in there. I would like to leave that in there versus this EEPROM. All right, the original chip's in. Will this thing give us the basic screen? Look at that, it is working. So I guess just sort of tweaking the pins with the needle nose did the trick. In fact, uh, what I should do is turn it on and bang it around a little bit. It's like my bang test is what I call this. Uh, okay, it froze. So that may well be, I'm gonna take the keyboard loop back off though, cause that was actually on there and it shouldn't be. No, okay, so it, it froze as soon as I did that. And I'm pretty sure that is because this chip is just not making good contact anymore in this socket. With the EEPROM back in, I should be able to bang this thing around without it freezing. No freezing, it is working. Okay, well that's a bummer. So this chip is good. I should put a check mark on it because it won't work in this machine, but it's gonna work in something else. So that is that is a good chip. So there we go. One working basket case of a board with burn marks on it. This thing is a survivor. And I have to say, this was a good lesson to show that even though the diagnostic cartridge said the PLA was bad, it really wasn't. It was just that ROM not getting selected properly causing that error. I can almost guarantee you if I take this ROM chip out of this board and we run the diagnostic again, it's going to blame the PLA again and say the PLA is bad. Let's just let's do that as a final test here. There it is. PLA test bad. And that's fake. <laughs> the problem is the ROM is not selecting or it's out of the machine or whatever. All right. So the final thing for this board is a label on this EEPROM. There it is. Because, you know, people don't like it when I leave the window exposed and might as well put this on with the original Commodore part. There we have it. One repaired 64C shortboard and the PAL version, which here in the United States, not super common. A huge thanks to Henning for sending in all of these boards for me to fix. Of course, I have more down there to get to, but I think this will be enough for this video. And as you saw, trying to repair boards that other people have already repaired before you, if they aren't so skilled at removing chips, can be really difficult. Really have to wonder how the back of this board got so burned. What kind of heat was being used that did this? The board is wavy under my finger here, both there on that burn, feels like it's delaminating, also here under the chip. So I do have to wonder what was really wrong with this board, um, assuming it was just the character ROM that failed originally. And once the board was butchered and not working properly, then the RAM was taken and whatever other chips and stuff were taken. But otherwise, as usual, 64C boards, very reliable. So I hope you found this video interesting in some way. And if you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. 
hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And don't forget to check out this second channel. There's tons of cool, interesting videos over there. And of course, I want to thank my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. If you want to become a patron, you can do so at the link in the description below. And I guess that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.